Mr. Burleson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and I want to say thank you, uh, Chief Modlin and Chief Chavez. And uh, please extend a, a hearty thank you to your agents who risked their lives for us. They're truly patriots and heroes for the United States. Um, sadly, the data has clearly shown that fentanyl seizures have gone through the roof since 2020. And, and you have mentioned during committee that criminals tend to follow the path of least resistance. Um, uh, Chief Chavez, you said, it, quote, unquote, that at one point the Remain in Mexico program has been effective, at least was in El Paso. Um, and then, again, during Mr. Fallon's testimony, um, you affirmed that those processes can have an impact on, uh, on agents' ability to enforce the laws of this nation. During Ms. McLean's testimony, you said that um, that there are really four outcomes, right? There's return, remove, transport, and then release. And then you said if you release more people, that could create more of an incentive for others to also cross illegally, which expects a more, more of a likelihood of release. So my question is that while I appreciate government efficiencies and processes, um, and I appreciate that the border is efficient, many times processing is leading to release. Is that, is that correct? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for, for your question. You know, uh, uh, the border situation is, is a dynamic one, and, and it's, it's a very complex environment, and we deal with all sorts of nationalities. Just in the RGV, we've arrested here this fiscal year uh, over 142 different uh, countries of people, right, coming from 142 different countries. And those four pathways or those four dispositions that we talked about, we still have a different pathways. They're either voluntary returns, uh, warrant of arrest, uh, notice to appear, either expedited um, removal or parole NTD or NTAs as well. Um, the release is the last option, sir, for us. It's not something we do easily. It's something that we take very much caution well, with. Uh, well, in what percentage of, of, of the four, what percentage is, is release used? I think uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't have the percentage amount here with me today, but it's something that we can certainly get back to you on with our headquarters. Have, have, my other question is, have we always had this approach to release or the parole uh, policy? Have, have we always had this approach that we have today? It has always been an option. Uh, but it, has, it been, has it been done the way that it's, been, that it's being performed today? N not in my experience. So, it has, so today we're doing things with parole and release differently than we have done in years past. Uh, it's been uh, practiced a little bit more um, uh, uh, fluidly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so with that being said, when you say fluid, uh, pre prior to 2020 um, was the process of parole, um, how fluid, how, how much more prevalent was that? I think previously it was a little bit uh, more restrictive. It required a lot more verifications and approvals up the chain of command up to our headquarters level. Okay, so that to me, so the process of the parole was more restrictive prior to 2020 than it is today. It, it was to a certain extent because even the releases today, we still need to make notification to our headquarters on releases, but chief patrol agents in the field today do have the purview based on the extent of their capacity levels to react to the um, ability to coordinate with their NGOs to try and have um, a release of migrants from their custody immediately if you see their capacity levels to be overwhelming. Okay, so then the question is, you know, the requirements are for parole, the path to parole is, is basically based on an only by case by case basis, and you have to provide the reason, the specific reason for that individual um, that, that is, am I wrong? Is that not what the law says? No, you are not wrong, sir. The thing is, we coordinate everything through ICRO. It is not directly done from CBP Border Patrol. It is in coordination with ICRO. They're at our facilities um, doing the, the processing with us jointly, and therefore it is coordinated with them and then the NGO. Okay, so who is recording the reason for the parole? It would be ICRO. ICRO, mm -hmm. okay, um, that, but that is being documented. 
Yes, sir. Because it is required by law that it be documented. Yes, it is documented. Everything is documented. So according to the Omnibus Appropriations Bill in 20, March of 2022, it required that within 60 days that there be a quarterly report um, to Congress, including the number of parole requests received and granted, and for those granted, the rationale for each grant and its duration. Um, are you, would you be surprised to know that the report that was released to Congress did not include any of the rationale for each parolee granted? I was not aware of that, sir. Um, but you believe, you agree with me that it would, be, it would be an expectation, if it's in the law, that it should be the responsibility of, um, to provide that information individually for each individual? I would think if it's a requirement to record, and then if it's uh, under law that it's required, that it's something that should be submitted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.